not having this mentality of food being completely transactional and like I have to train in order to get my food today. Like it doesn't work that way. Our bodies don't don't operate with this sort of transaction. So understanding that our, our body needs fuels. Welcome to Salad with a Side of Fries. I'm your host, Jen Trepic, talking wellness and weight loss for real life. We're here to clear up the myths, misinformation, bad science and marketing to teach you how to eat and how to cheat. Are you ready? I'm having salad with a side of fries. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Salad with a Side of Fries. I'm your host, Jen Trepic, always here with you every week. So it's December, which on some level, I feel like 2020, like the end of 2020 might never come. And then on the other hand, I'm like December. I'm not really sure what happened to half of the months of this year. Like I just blocked them out. Anyway, I'm excited for today's conversation because we're focusing on a slightly different side of nutrition. We're focusing on performance nutrition, and I'm thrilled to introduce you to our featured guest. She's a nutrition coach, founder of her own nutrition coaching company, which recently celebrated five years in business. She's a wife, traveler, and lover of the outdoors. Being in the fitness industry for almost a decade, she combines her research and educational background with her fitness and nutrition experience to help individuals lose body fat, increase lean mass, and improve performance and overall health through evidence-based methods. Exactly why we're all about it, right? Exactly why she's here. You know that. Uh, She started as a CrossFit trainer, then shifted her focus to nutrition, working as a nutrition coach. Her priority is supporting her clients while also managing her team of coaches. Together, they've helped hundreds of people change their bodies and eating habits, as well as breaking the myths around dieting and healthy lifestyle. Again, you see why she's joining us. We're very much aligned and on the same page. So she believes in good workout buddies, kindness, pink sugar cookies, long hikes, a 9 a.m. bedtime, and sharing evidence-based truth. She has a bachelor's degree in exercise science, a master's degree in public health, and is a certified health education specialist. Without further ado, I give you Kate Lyman. Thank you for having me. I cannot (laughs) believe, like you said, it's almost the new year. I'm like, oh man, like even my bio needs to be updated because now it's a decade. I said like almost a decade, like time is passing. What the heck? (laughs) <laughs> Seriously. So what have you been up to? How is life in Memphis? How is Thanksgiving? All the things. Well, I've actually left Memphis now. We just moved. Um, went to Utah for Thanksgiving, en route now to California to spend Christmas with my family, and then moving to Mexico indefinitely. So it's a lot has happened since we talked last. That's so exciting. We're in know, Mexico. Moving to Oaxaca. Nice. Oh, yeah. 2021 is going to be your year. It's going to be better than the last year. I'm determined. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had a great 2020. I f- almost feel silly saying it, but like the bar is definitely different for, you know, 2020 and beyond. Yeah, as it should be. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so I'm super excited to get into your story and our focus for today. But really quick, I want to let our members know what they're getting this week. So, You guys, your recipe is for slow-cooked salmon with chickpeas and greens. Don't be deceived by the name. You don't need a slow cooker. Uh, It actually, it cooks in the oven, but at a lower temp for a longer amount of time than we would normally cook it. So interesting, different way to do salmon. It also has a delicious vinaigrette that you put on top. And so you could certainly use that with other meals too. So I know you're going to love this one. And this month is also the last month of the quarter, which means it's time for your live Q&A. And you guys loved it so much last time, so we're doing it again as a one-on-one. So you and I get to book our one-on-one 30-minute session. The link to do that will be in your email this week as well. So if you're hearing these recipes every week and always think, hmm, that sounds good, and now you're like, oh, wait, and a free one-on-one? Hmm. So it's not too late to get in on this. You simply join the membership program and it's all yours. Go to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries. For just $10 a month, you get weekly recipes, a monthly article or tool, extra discounts from me and our partners, plus access to live Q&A sessions, which like we said, this quarter is a one-on-one. 
So it's seriously a bargain. When you take advantage of the full offerings, it's free because you're saving more than the $10 cost. I always say, show yourself that your health is a priority with this membership. Plus, by being a member, you support this podcast and this community so that we can continue bringing you new episodes and experts every week. Remember, all you have to do is head over to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries or click the link in the show notes. Once there, click support now and to your email and payment method, click subscribe and you're all set to get this week's recipe for the slow cooked salmon with chickpeas and greens and your one-on-one for the quarter. Okay, Kate, take us back to the beginning. Like you studied exercise science You have your master's in public health. You also studied social and behavioral health and nutrition. So did you always know that this is what you wanted to do? Like, absolutely not. (laughs) It's so crazy. (laughs) It's so crazy because it makes sense. Um, But at the same time, no, I definitely never thought I would be a nutrition coach. I always thought I would have like a quote unquote real job. Um, Mm -hmm. I I wanted to be a PA, a physician assistant for so long. Um, And I was like, midway through PA school applications before I kind of changed course. And that wasn't even to nutrition. It was to applying for a master's in public health degree. Um, Just I kind of felt like I wanted to focus more on the prevention side. And it was about the same time that I started taking nutrition clients because it was an interest of mine. So like I had studied it in undergrad. I had been, you know, following precision nutrition and doing other research on my own on the side and um, you know, s- started working with clients first, like for free, you know, to help, and then like starting with paid clients. And I did that all all the way through grad school. And um, at no time did it ever cross my mind that it would be like a real job. Um, maybe because I love totally. it too much. I don't know. I mean, I think that's it, honestly. Um, you know, so I actually finished my MPH and then I had applied for um, a doctoral program and I moved to Memphis, Tennessee from Utah to start that program. It was in social and behavioral science. And there came a time where I had to choose um, between continuing with my PhD and, you know, getting in it or continuing with Kate Lyman Nutrition because I could not do both. I was drowning. I was dying. I loved working with my clients. I was miserable in school and it, and it, it sounds like it would be an obvious choice. And it wasn't at the time because I was like, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a researcher. I I didn't even like it. You know, I wasn't even (laughs) having fun. Um, But I think it was like feeling like there was more validation in the title or the degree, um, which just isn't true at all. And so um, it it was a laborious decision. There were tears involved and a lot of thinking, you know, and I, um, and I obviously ultimately chose nutrition coaching and I, I mean, like I've said, I love it. Like I love it so much. I love working with my clients. It is so fulfilling. It is so wonderful. Um, it is so hard <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and that's really the business side of things are so hard for me because the coaching um, is fun and wonderful. And, um, you know, the uh, the different type of people I get to work with and different type of clients, the friends I've made out of clients, it's just incredible. Um, but no, I never, ever thought I would get here. And it's funny because I always thought that fitness was like just a side gig, like a way to pay for college. Um, that's what I thought when I was coaching CrossFit. And now I'm married to my husband who we met at CrossFit and he manages a CrossFit gym full time. Like this is what we do. We do fitness. And I would have never, ever thought that would be the case. Yeah. I I want to highlight one of the things you just said, which was like, we have this idea in our head of what we're supposed to do or in theory, what we want to do. And then we get there and we're like, I actually hate this. So I just, I appreciate you sharing because, you know, permission for all of us to be like, wait, what? I'm going to stop. Like, we don't have to continue doing the things that we started when we realized we totally hate it. Absolutely. I believe that so much. So, and then I, you know, you started, you talked about, you know, working at CrossFit. And so, you know, working there and then in your practice, you see people who have performance goals and people who have weight loss or fat loss goals. And one of the things I want us to highlight is like the difference in those approaches. Because a lot of what we talk about on the show overall is, we tend to touch on both, but much more of the nutrition and fat loss side rather than the performance side. So for you and in your practice, 
What do you see as like the fundamental differences there? I I love this topic because they are so different. And I think the main message has to be that to an extent you have to choose. You have to choose your primary goal because the way we address fat loss goals is not the same way we address performance goals. And, you know, I, I too usually direct a lot of my content towards those fat loss goals because it's an area where there is more confusion, more overwhelm, more in- yeah. misinformation, um, and a broader range of people trying to to work towards those fat loss goals. It feels, um, you know, the pool of people trying to get better at CrossFit or their specific sport or running or races or competing in whatever sport they're in um, feels a little smaller. So the differences are in in every aspect in how we address our goals, the level of adherence they require the entire nutritional approach, whether we're eating in a calorie deficit for fat loss goals, like with the intention um, of, you know, eating below our maintenance calories to burn body fat, or if we're eating at maintenance or in a surplus in order to fuel our training so that it is as optimal as it can be. So recovery is as as optimal as, as it can be. And sometimes body composition changes are a result of that, but they're never the primary goal. Yeah. And it's so interesting because I think, you know, like you said, even, you know, your a lot of your content is focused on the fat loss stuff. And so I feel like what happens is that we're bombarded with so much information, like social media, the news, our friends, we hear what they're doing and we think maybe I should do that without kind of taking a beat to think about what our actual goals are. Absolutely. You know, and so what's one thing that you would say for people to think about in terms of deciding, you know, where their focus needs to be? Is it the fat loss or is it performance? And sometimes it's obvious, right? Like they're training for a marathon, but sometimes it's not so obvious. Right. And I think for a majority of us, it's not so obvious because we're kind of going through life just trying to do it all. So I think the the important thing is recognizing that there are phases in our nutrition and in our health and in our performance. And if we understand that all of that is cyclical, we can kind of, um, you know, it's never this cut and dry, but we can kind of plan out like, okay, I'd like to pursue a fat loss phase before summer. And then in the winter, I'd like to compete in trail running and ultra marathons, or then I'd like to try to get stronger and do my first powerlifting competition, you know, and it doesn't even have to be running marathons and powerlifting competitions, or just, I'd like to improve my strength in the gym period. Um, and understanding that we can really have different goals, but they require different timelines and different phases. You can do it all, but never at the same time. And I think if you understand, like, folks, we have years ahead of us. Like, we don't need to do all the things right now because we're just going to get frustrated when we come up short. So understanding yeah. that, like, let's just plot out what we want now, see what feels like more of a priority now, see what makes more sense now, and then go from there. Yeah. And when you say now, right, how long is that now? Because I think sometimes what happens is that I often see it with people where they're like, well, I have you know, fat loss goals. So I have fat loss meals, but then right before my workout, I try to go for that performance meal. And it's sort of like this giant blend of the two. And so like when we're looking at this in terms of phases and you talked about seasons, right? How can we sort of think about sticking with one approach versus the other? Yeah. It's hard to give a timeline because everyone's somewhere different, but we're talking months here. We're not, we're not talking weeks or days. We're talking about, okay, you have fat loss goals. Um, depending on your dieting history, where you've been before, what your activity looks like, you know, we might need to spend time eating at maintenance before we then go into calorie deficit. We will be in a calorie deficit six to 12 to 14 weeks, you know, depends on dieting history again. And then we'll come out of that calorie deficit in a safe way while maintaining progress. So, you know, we're looking at a few months here and that's fine because doing it right means we'll be able to maintain that progress we've made and maintain it as we then shift towards the next goal. And I think it's also important to remember that like being at maintenance and maintaining the progress we've made, whether in the gym or in our physical body composition is also a goal. So take time for that too. Yes. Amen. Mic drop to that. Right. (laughs) So let's talk about um, 
you know, the general guidelines for fueling for performance. And then we can get into some things more specific in a minute. But so like overarching guidelines fueling for performance. So we are not going to be eating in a calorie deficit if we're working to fuel for performance, right? Whether that performance means gaining muscle mass or just fueling to train better, if it's maybe more of an endurance athlete, we're not eating in a deficit. Um, We're probably focusing on a little bit more carbs because carbs are a really good energy source. Again, it depends on the sport, but I work with a lot of endurance athletes or triathletes, and then we're really focusing on on you know, on the carbs, we're also putting a bigger focus on recovery and making sure there's adequate recovery days from training, but also that we're fueling well on those training days too. Awesome. And so, you know, you mentioned recovery, which I want to come back to, you know, optimizing training, like pre and post workout meals, um, you know, all these kinds of things. So what would you recommend more specifically for like those pre and post workout meals or what does it look like in a day perhaps yeah, to so, fuel performance? Yeah. So I think that's another thing. And I didn't even say this. So I'm glad you brought this up, but we do want to focus maybe a little more on meal timing, knowing that it's not the end all be all. But if we're, if we're trying to get the absolute most we can out of our training sessions, eating around those sessions is going to be helpful. It's not make it or break it, but it is helpful. So, you know, kind of a rule of thumb is that pre-workout, whether that's an hour or a few hours, you know, that's going to be up to the individual and how they feel working out on a, on a full stomach. Um, we're getting some carbs in and some lean or protein with little less fat in that meal. Um, and, you know, that could look like 20 to 30 grams of protein, maybe 20 to 30% of their total daily carbs, keeping fat on the lower side so we're not trying to digest all this heavy food as we work out. Um, our post-workout meal looks pretty similar. It's going to be lower in fat. We're getting some protein in there, um, you know, to help with recovery and carbs, again, to help with recovery, about 20 to 30% of our total daily carbs and about 30-ish grams of protein um, and we're focusing on drinking water. And we're also understanding that this doesn't mean you have to finish your workout, take off your shoes and two seconds later, pound a shake. Like (laughs) it's not, our body isn't like, I need my protein right this second, right? Like we have a few hours to get that done, but like, let's try to get a meal in after our workouts when it feels right. (laughs) I love that you bring that up because I definitely get those questions of like, well, what what should I put in my gym bag? Like you have time. It's okay. Yeah. Like you can sit down and eat a meal. (laughs) Right. Um, And the other thing you, you talked about some of the, you know, triathletes. And so let's talk about also the difference between endurance training and muscle building, because I think, you know, nothing we talk about is ever straightforward. And, but, you know, we have like performance versus fat loss. And then even within performance, there's smaller categories. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and, and as long as people understand it's like so individual, but just speaking in generalized, generalized terms, you know, our, our athlete who's trying to be in a powerlifting competition, we're not going to have as big of a focus on like intra workout carbs. If they feel like they need them or want them during a workout, like go for it. Um, you know, a long two hour lifting session. Sure. If that makes you feel good, like let's do it. But an, an endurance athlete who is training for long periods of time, like that's a necessity. And not only because our body needs fuel as we are training, but because eating is part of the training. And I think this is a really big thing we miss in this endurance world. And, you know, I've done um, a few years of ultra marathons and they've been a blast. And I used to think like, you know, like, great, I get to eat extra carbs today. I'll do it after my run. And it even took me a few years to recognize, wait, like I feel way better when I do it during the run, right? Like we need that fuel during our performance. Um, Also because our body needs to get used to the running while eating or the biking while drinking. You know, it's, we're training our bodies to also be a little more comfortable with managing some digestion as we're on the go. Yeah, it's so interesting because I think this is one of those things where people feel that discomfort, right? So we make the recommendation of, you know, training during that endurance workout, right? And then they're like, oh, but my stomach was upset, so I don't think I should do that. Mm 
But what you're saying here is that we're training our body. I love that phrase. We're training our body as much as we're training for the event. Absolutely. Because digesting food, <laughs> eating it too, while you're right. running is does not come naturally. Like we're not used to doing that because it's not that comfortable. And there's going to be some gastric upset in, from the beginning. But we have to understand that that's going to get better. Like, yes, there is finding which foods feel a little better for us. Um, but there's always going to be, not always, but for most of us, there's going to be a little upset in the beginning. And that's something we trained through. And and I've been on that other side being like, why would I eat now? It hurts. Like, I'll just do it during the race. Like, bad move. <laughs> really, <laughs> really bad move. You know, like if we can get into the race knowing what feels best, how to eat it and like breathe at the same time, like what our body is going to feel like responding to that food, then we're not having to think about food. We know what we're doing. We're thinking about our run. Yeah. It's, I love that you brought that up and, you know, clarified it in that way for people because it's something that I think not enough of us talk about. And then on the other side of the coin, in terms of really focusing on muscle building, how does that play into so maybe or differentiate some of those choices? So we're going to, um, you know, not maybe not focus as much on specific carb intake, but calories in general, protein needs to be adequate, meaning about 0.7 to one gram per pound of body weight. Um, and you know, that doesn't need to be on the high end just because someone's working towards muscle growth, like anywhere in that range, whatever seems pretty sustainable and reasonable for them. Um, and they're going to have a little more leniency as far as like splitting carbs and fats, because, um, yes, carbs are fuel, fats are fuel as well, but it's not as imperative that they're like eating this crazy high carb diet. You know, someone could um, sustain performance goals on a higher fat diet if that's their preference. Um, so really, we're kind of shifting that focus more towards overall calories. Awesome. This is such great, like tactical information. I love it so much. Um, we're going to dig into recovery and a couple more things in a second. Take a quick break for a message from our partner for this episode, Lumiere de Vie Skincare. Lumiere de Vie Skincare was founded by Amber Ridinger McLaughlin and responds to her own experience of mere marginal results from countless costly creams. She realized the revitalization of her youthful skin could only occur if she developed products herself. Working closely with beauty scientists and exploring the most advanced ingredients derived from the earth and sea, Amber created Lumiere de Vie, the next generation of skincare. The extensive line of luxury skincare products is designed to address all skin types and concerns, including uneven texture or tone, dryness, and fatigue skin. With the highest quality natural ingredients and powerful formulas that help heal, soothe, moisturize, and protect, Lumiere de Vie acts as first aid for your skin. The result, rejuvenated, luminous, beautiful looking skin. So it's officially holiday season and everyone on your list would love these awesome products. So I recommend the Lumiere de Vie Skincare Value Kits. So the women's kit gives you the facial cleanser, toner, and intense rejuvenation cream, all three for $125. The men's kit gives you the Lumiere de Vie Ohm Cleansing Gel, Restoring Serum, and Hydrating Aloe Cream for $90. So I use these products every single day. I feel like I'm at the spa every time I wash my face. So these are gifts that will not disappoint. And you have plenty of time to get them before the holidays. Plus, you get 10% off. So to get 10% off your order, text the word SKIN, S-K-I-N, to 844-947-4846. You'll receive the link and coupon code right to your phone. Again, simply text the word SKIN to 844-947-4846 to try Lumiere de Vie Skincare and get 10% off. This is a toll-free number. Standard text and data rates may apply. Okay, Kate, talk to us about recovery and, you know, physical recovery. We know, right? It's that idea of take a break. But what do we do nutritionally to foster muscular recovery and repair? So nothing's too different if we're if we already have these focuses that we talked about, like adequate protein, which is important for both those uh, strength building athletes and those endurance athletes. Um, really, the the big thing to to talk about is like 
not cutting calories because we're not training one day. Like our body is trying to fuel and it's trying to repair and it's trying to recover and we need that food in order to do so. So not having this mentality of food being completely transactional and like I have to train in order to get my food today. Like it doesn't work that way. Our bodies don't don't operate with this sort of transaction. So understanding that our our body needs fuels fuel just on those days off um, is really, that's it. But sometimes that's hard to grasp when we've been under the impression that, that, you know, I have to work out in order to earn my food today, or, you know, I have to eat less because I didn't move as much. Yeah. And of course, right, like hydration and sleep. But I always ask because I'm the worst about recovery days. So I'm going to ask you too, like, what do you do on your recovery day? And what do we actually need? Like what qualifies or how do we know when we're ready for the next workout? I think it's the ability to kind of, and it's hard to say, listen to your body, but like really to be a little more in tune with what your body's asking and your body isn't going to most times scream like help stop. I need to recover, but we might be a little more achy. We might be a little more sore than we usually are. We might, you know, try to wake up in the morning and feel so fatigued and groggy. And usually these are signs that we're like, you know, under a little more physical stress. And those are good signs that we should probably um, step back and take a recovery day. I talk sleep a lot with my clients because I think it's something that's so, so easy to overlook. Um, you know, like I got a poor night's sleep and then I went on with my day and I don't know why my day sucked so bad. Like I, my training was horrible and I wanted to eat everything in sight. Like our sleep really directs how our day goes. And, you know, for my clients who actually work out early in the morning, if they're feeling run down, I'm always going to tell them, hey, get that extra hour or two of sleep instead of going to the gym. Like this one sacrifice, this one day, I know it feels like a sacrifice, but this is going to pay dividends on the rest of your training days as opposed to going into a training possibly underfueled, definitely um, like sleep deprived and risking injury which is infinitely worse than just missing one day in the gym. A thousand percent. And the last thing I want to talk about, you mentioned a second ago, and I want to come back to it. And that is this idea of a transactional relationship between our nutrition and our exercise and activity and our workouts. So walk us through this and like why it's so flawed. Yeah, it's it's incredibly incorrect because one, it's like really fostering a, a pretty negative relationship with food and with exercise, which is not ideal for a multitude of reasons. But also our body doesn't work on this like transaction system where like, oh, you burned 300 calories, now consume 300 calories, right? Like it's, uh, we're talking, like when we're even talking about averages of like intake averages of like total daily under energy expenditure it's averages we're not talking every single day right like our body works really in averages um so you know it's not transactional and our body isn't not working out so it's not doing anything you know um and i try to really shift this conversation from from my clients thinking they need to to uh, work out in order to eat, just saying, hey, have you fueled properly so you've earned the right to work out? Because if you're going into a workout under fueled, you're not going to approach it with maybe the desired intensity and you're not even going to get out of it what you want. It's like empty training, you know? So fuel appropriately so that you can go into your workout and have that make a difference. And I think that's that's like where we need to kind of have this little flip flip the switch as far as mentality towards um, both fueling and working out goes. A thousand percent. I love this so much. So I'm repeating it because I think sometimes we all need to hear things more than once. And what you shared is to shift our mindset from earning our food to earning our workouts and earning our training. Absolutely. That. And I also think, yeah. and, And I mean, honestly, this could apply to all areas of life. I think so. Absolutely. Like, I mean, we just talked about basically the same thing with sleep, right? Exactly. Exactly. So Kate, anything we missed or anything else you want to share before we go to some off topic questions? Um, I, I don't know. I think the main takeaway 
when we're talking in this topic of, you know, feeling for performance and and letting listeners know that that doesn't mean you have to be a marathon runner or an Olympic weightlifter. Um, you could just be trying to get better in your CrossFit gym or your HIIT classes or your at home workouts. Like our body does not give us the results we want when we're working on off of a state of depletion. Like we will never perform optimally, sleep optimally, look the best we can, et cetera, et cetera, coming from a state of depletion. So fuel your body with the intention of being better. And you'll find that more food isn't, it, it isn't incorrect. It's not the, it's not detrimental. It's actually the opposite. And under fueling is usually what gets us to this point where we're injured or not seeing the results we want from the gym or not seeing physical and body composition changes that we want to see. It's, it's, usually the opposite of what we think. Agreed. I had a, it's, this is, I had a, a new client referred to me and we had our, an initial conversation. It was exactly the same. Her mindset, everything was, well, less is more. It's like, well, not so much, <laughs> you know, like if you're feeling deprived, we're doing this wrong. Correct. You know, absolutely. So awesome. All right. So now it's time for our short list of rapid fire off topic questions that I ask every expert who joins us. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. What's the best thing you've done for your health this week? And what's the naughtiest thing you've done related to your health this week? Oh, man. Uh, best thing is I went to the gym today, even though I had like zero des- desire to do so, but I needed to just move in some capacity. And then imagine that my mood was like 10,000 times better after. Naughtiest thing is I just drank three Diet Dr. Peppers at 4 p.m. before getting on our call, which is bad. <laughs> but I caffeine. agree. I love Dr. Pepper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. So we're really talking about caffeine intake here. It's not ideal, but you know, got to do what you got to do sometimes. Exactly. All right. If you weren't a nutrition coach, what would you do? I would be a plastic surgeon. Interesting. Yes. I love plastic surgery, TV shows, and YouTube and Instagram. It's ridiculous. That's funny. You're the first person to say that. Yeah. Well, there you go. Awesome. Okay. Favorite book on any topic other than your area of expertise could be fiction too. Oh, this isn't very rapid fire. I am a reader. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to say Atomic Habits for just living life really, really well and Pride and Prejudice because I read it every year around Christmas because it's the best. Oh, such a – both. Agree with both of those. Okay, if you could cure one ailment, disease, or sickness, what would it be? My younger sister has Crohn's disease and there's no cure and that would be it. Yes, my cousin has Crohn's too. If you were a superhero, what would be your superpower? Teleportation. Me too. Vacation. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about the vacations. <laughs> I know. We're the same person. Um, what's your biggest pet peeve? Loud chewing. Agreed. Finally, in your opinion, what's the next frontier in wellness? I think it is just that the answer, wellness. Wellness and, and pursuing wellness instead of pursuing fat loss or pursuing um, crazy diets or or pursuing like being the best at everything or doing all things at the same time. It's literally pursuing wellness and understanding that that means something different to every single person. I love that so much. Kate, thank you. One more time. We so appreciate you being here. Tell everybody how to connect with you and where to find you. Yeah. So I hang out on Instagram way too much, but you know, that's where I am. So you can find me on Instagram at KL nutrition. Um, I love getting nutrition questions. So send them my way. Um, and you know, while like we talked about a lot of that content is fat loss related, I do share a lot of my personal nutrition, what's going on for me. And usually that's more of what we're talking, um, training performance nutrition. So I'm not, any type of star athlete, but I like to do a lot of fun things and I like to fuel them well. Um, and then you can find me on my website at katelimanutrition.com. You can actually go to the resources tab and I have several free resources you can download there. My favorite being um, a cookbook called Everyday Macros focused on batch prepping um, just to kind of make our lives easier. Amazing. Awesome. And so we'll put links to everything in the show notes. Thank you again. Super appreciate spending the time with us and sharing your tips and expertise. 
Uh, you have another minute to hang out for our nutrition nugget? I would love to. Perfect. This week, we're talking about olive oil. Now, we all know olive oil is one of those quote-unquote healthy fats, right? But what does it actually give us? So olive oil is an unsaturated fat, which means it's a liquid at room temperature. But when chilled, it actually will solidify. So technically, it's a monounsaturated fat, which means that it's a fat molecule that has one unsaturated carbon bond in the molecule. That's called a double bond. So you don't need to know that for everyday life, but sometimes, you know, you guys ask and, you know, I sometimes get the question of the difference between mono and polyunsaturated fats. So we like the monounsaturated fats because of all of these things, and they actually help lower bad cholesterol. Other health benefits that come from olive oil are due to its antioxidant properties. So this is because it contains what we call polyphenols. Polyphenols have been shown in studies to reduce morbidity and slow the progression of cardiovascular, neurodegenerative, and cancer diseases. As antioxidants, polyphenols are known to decrease the level of free radicals or reactive oxygen species in the body. They have anti-inflammatory, anti-allergic, anti-atherogenic, anti-thrombotic, and anti-mutagenic effects. So even more interesting and appropriate for right now is that there's some research showing that polyphenols can modulate the human immune system by affecting the proliferation and activity of white blood cells, as well as the production of cytokines or other factors that participate in the immunological defense. So in animals also, they lower blood pressure, increase blood flow through the coronary arteries, slow down the heart rate, and normalize intestinal muscle contractions. So all good things. Who knew some of it, right? (laughs) I went to the studies for some of these. Um, Here's the catch, though. The concentration of polyphenols varies in different kinds of olive oil. And this depends on the process used to extract the oil from the olives, among other things. So virgin olive oil has high polyphenol content. Refined oil has very low. And this is like the difference between 150 to 400 milligrams per kilogram in virgin olive oil versus 0 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram in the very low. So like This is dramatic, right? Sometimes they'll mix the two, virgin and refined, to create a mixed olive oil. And that's actually most often called common olive oil. And we find that it has low as opposed to very low polyphenol content. So that's like 10 to 100 milligrams per kilogram of the polyphenols. So studies showed that the refined olive oil is devoid of vitamins, polyphenols, phytosterols, and other low molecular natural ingredients. So when we look at extra virgin olive oil, it's more expensive because the quantity produced is lower, but it contains the highest level of polyphenols. It's actually what we want when we think of what we're getting from olive oil. Another interesting thing is... um, the properties of the olive oil are impacted by the filtration. So unfiltered olive oil preserves additional polyphenols that are typically lost when filtered. And it's basically, all of it comes down to the polyphenol range really depends on agronomic factors, things like the ripeness of the the olive, the extraction technology, and even the storage and packaging processes of the olive oil. So we want to choose virgin or extra virgin olive oil. So let's talk about cooking with olive oil for a second, because when cooking with any oil, we want to be careful about the smoke point. And this is the temperature at which the oil burns. And this is important because when oil burns, it lets off carcinogens, free radicals, and can damage the healthful properties of the oil. It actually does the opposite of what we're expecting to get from the olive oil. So olive oil has a smoke point of 325 degrees Fahrenheit, which means I would use it more for light sauteing sauces like pesto or salad dressing. So for quick comparison, walnut oil has a 400 degree smoke point, 
So good for like baking, sauteing, sprinkling on salad. Sunflower is 450 degrees. Safflower oil is 510. And avocado oil is 520 degrees Fahrenheit. So think about the avocado oil for when you're roasting or grilling or stir frying. All right. Lastly, we need to talk about reading labels. And we always talk about reading labels. And actually, yes, we have to do it for the olive oil too. So there are many products out there with packaging that says olive oil or says virgin olive oil. But when we read the ingredients, it's actually a mix of oil, sometimes olive oil mixed with vegetable oil. So we really have to be careful and read the ingredients. And we already discussed that, you know, most of the highly refined olive oil and those mixes are devoid of what we're looking for. So read carefully. Don't be fooled. And last thing is maybe you've seen like the extra light olive oil in your store. And I've had people tell me they choose it because light's good for us, right? (laughs) Well, not so much. In this case, the light olive oil is extra refined, which is what gives it its higher smoke point. But we know that that means less polyphenols and removes the health benefits. So if you see the label pure olive oil on something, read carefully. This is often what they call the blended olive oils. And if you really want to learn more about all these categories and standards, you can check out the International Olive Council, because who knew that was a thing? (laughs) All right. So wrapping this up, virgin and extra virgin olive oil have tremendous health benefits, provided we don't use them to cook at super high temperatures. I would say for that, go for the avocado oil. And we must read the labels carefully to make sure that what we're getting is actually olive oil that still has its polyphenol content. Avoid the light, extra light, mixed, pure, all the other labels, and read the ingredients to make sure we're actually getting the good stuff. Kate, one more time, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for having me. And I just learned so much about olive oil. I never knew most of that. So this is great. (laughs) It's amazing, right? It is. Totally crazy. So as always, guys, I'm your host, Jen Trepic. Connect with me on Instagram at Jen Trepic, J-E-N-N-T-R-E-P-E-C-K. Our Facebook page is at the same handle. So DM to submit your questions, ideas, key takeaways. Seriously, hearing from you is the highlight of my every day. And this is also the best way to reach out to learn more about working with me directly. Of course, if you're not already, join the membership program by going to glow.fm slash salad with a side of fries to show your support for this podcast, this community, and most importantly, your health. Plus, you'll get this week's recipe for the slow-cooked salmon with chickpeas and greens, and details for booking your quarterly Q&A session, which will be a one-on-one. With that, we'll see you next Wednesday. Until then, remember to earn your workouts instead of earning your food. Well, friends, that's it for today's episode of Salad with a Side of Fries. Congratulations for making yourself and your health a priority. Thanks so much for joining us. Be sure to click subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast platform, Share us with a friend and we'll be back next week. Always remember, you deserve it and you are worth it. Happy healthy.